ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, is the world's largest educational and scientific computing society, uniting educators, researchers, and practitioners to inspire dialogue, share resources, and address the field's challenges. ACM strengthens the computing profession's collective voice through strong leadership, promotion of the highest standards, and recognition of technical excellence. ACM recognizes technical excellence through its eminent series of awards for outstanding achievement and contributions to computer science and information technology. Each year, ACM is proud to bring recipients of the ACM AM Touring Award and recipients of the ACM Prize in Computing to participate in the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, the premier networking event for mathematicians and computer scientists from all over the world. The ACM AM Turing Award is given to individuals selected for lasting contributions of major technical importance. It bears the name of Alan M. Turing, who in 1936 launched the modern computer era with his classic paper on computable numbers. In it, Turing conceived an amazingly simple device that captured the notion of what it meant to compute. He then proved that his universal Turing machine could compute anything that was computable. In 1950, he published Computing Machinery and Intelligence, in which he developed the criterion, now known as the Turing test, to determine whether or not a machine could actually think. His ideas and this experiment are now widely acknowledged as the foundation for artificial intelligence. In 1966, ACM instituted the AM Turing Award to honor his memory. Today, it is universally recognized as the Nobel Prize of Computing. ACM also presents annually the ACM Prize in Computing. Past recipients of this honor include Dina Katabi, Alexei Efros, and Daphne Kohler. This award recognizes an early to mid-career fundamental innovative contribution that through its depth, impact, and broad implications exemplifies great achievement in computing. Among the Turing laureates participating in the Heidelberg Laureate Forum this year are David Patterson, Whitfield Diffie, Martin Hellman, Michael Stonebreaker, Leslie Lamport, Silvio Micali, Leslie G. Valiant, Joseph Sifakis, Vinton G. Cerf, Frederick Brooks, Richard E. Stearns, Butler Lampson, William Kahan, Ivan Sutherland, John Hopcroft, Robert Tarjan, Richard M. Karp, Stephen A. Cook, and C. Anthony R. Hoare. Recipients of the ACM Prize in Computing who will attend include Sanjeev Arora and Jeffrey Dean. As the digital revolution continues and as communication is increasingly relegated to technical platforms and digital media, it is vitally important to create an environment for personal communication for those dedicated to science, both those who are role models and the young researchers beginning their careers. The Heidelberg Laureate Forum provides that environment, an opportunity for scientific heroes of previous generations to inspire the next generation of scientists. In bringing Turing laureates and ACM Prize recipients together, with the finest young researchers from around the world for a full week, ACM is helping to make that happen. All right, hello, good afternoon everybody. Uh, I am Dr. Tom Crawford. I'm a mathematician at the University of Oxford and I also appear a lot on uh, YouTube in my, my own channel, Tom Rocks Maths and also with the channel Number File. Uh, it's a great pleasure this afternoon to be joined by uh, Vicky Hansen, the CEO of uh, the ACM, which we have just seen a fantastic introductory video about, completely ruining all of my introduction that I was going to say. The video has covered it all for me, uh, which is great. So uh, Vicky, I guess I'll pass over you just to introduce yourself a little bit, and then we will open up the floor to questions. Uh, so anybody at all who, who wants to ask anything, get thinking. So Vicky. Yeah, hi. Good to be here. Uh, yeah, the video took away a lot of what I would have said in an intro too, but let, let me just repeat some of the points because uh, I do know that it went fast. 
ACM uh, is the world's oldest and largest professional computing society. We serve about 100,000 members in 190 different countries. But in addition to the members that we have, we have a number of people who take advantage of our services, our um, digital library, for example, our conferences that we have. And through these kinds of activities, we actually serve about 3 million computing professionals worldwide. The uh, members come from all areas of computing. So we have an emphasis on artificial intelligence, machine learning, cybersecurity, privacy, human computer interaction. So this is through um, 37 different special interest groups we have and through more than 50 journal publications that really broadly cover the entire area of computing. And I just wanna, th there is one sentence in the video that I liked and I wanted to say something about. Um, there's a sentence that says, ACM strengthens the computing profession's collective voice through strong leadership, promotion of the highest standards and recognition of technical excellence. And I thought that was a great way of explaining what our mission is. Um, our society members um, are all leaders of computing and collectively they do help shape the field. As I said, we broadly cover all areas of computing. This week you've been fortunate enough to see talks and interactions uh, with a number of our laureates, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, collectively, ACM has a large number of technologists and together we really do set the pace for what is going on in the field of computing. Uh, the other thing that this uh, sentence talks about is ACM working to promote the highest standards in computing. Uh, this is evidenced in a number of things that ACM does. For example, we have a code of ethics and part of that is working toward the betterment of society, using computing um, for the good of society. And we also, um, as a collective voice, because we are such a large voice, we are able to inform uh, legislation worldwide. Um, what we do is provide nonpartisan um, information to governments and other um, deciding bodies when they're going to um, make decisions that affect technology in our lives. And I will leave it at that for now. <laughs> well, I'm going to immediately jump on your, your final point. So you, you then mentioned this, this ability to uh, advise governments and, and organizations about uh, decisions involving computers and technology. So does that mean you've been pretty busy, uh, shall we say, in 2020? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, I won't go into all that they do. Um, I can mention a couple of things. But uh, let me just say that we have a, a technology policy council that works on global issues. And the idea is to work on uh, technology issues that will affect everyone. And we also recognize that there are some issues that are very specific to specific regions. So we have a US technology policy committee and a Europe technology policy committee. And just this, a couple of examples of the things they do, for example, um, the Europe, uh, technology committee came out uh, with a statement this year about contact tracing apps in this time of COVID, looking at the privacy security of those apps and also looking at the usability and trying to get people to trust them, telling, um, giving technical advice on what would lead to more trust about using such devices. And our US committee, for example, came out with a statement this year about facial recognition applications. And that was, um, informing government bodies about potential biases that can be introduced in facial recognition applications. The, um, the, it's, it's interesting you mentioned there the, the apps and the, the data security. So um, in the UK, where I am at the moment, we've just, as of today, released the, the government sort of um, COVID tracing app. So I have spent the morning downloading and, and registering myself for that in the safe knowledge that, that you know, organizations like, like yourselves have been making sure that the data is used properly. Um, yeah. Uh, so the, the trust is so important because people simply aren't going to do it if they, if they aren't going to use them. And it, it's pointless if, if not a lot of people use them. So what is it that will make people trust them, right? how is the government going to give you enough information that you understand it's going to be used for good and not that the government is doing something with your data that you're very concerned about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so of course, uh, we are joined by lots of the, the young researchers uh, at the moment. So 
I, I suppose it's it's probably worth sort of asking the question that maybe a lot of those that they are thinking, which is what uh, specifically can the the ACM do for young researchers? Do you have any specific programs or conferences aimed at, at that particular sort of uh, people in that stage of their career? We don't have conferences aimed at young researchers, um, but there are a couple things that we do. I, I would say, for example that many people first get involved in ACM through our student chapters. Worldwide, there are hundreds of student chapters that you can get involved with, many at, at local universities, sometimes they're regional. I can't tell you specifically where to look, but if you can go on the ACM website, you can see where the chapters are and hopefully get involved. And they have a lot of activities specifically for younger people designed for training. Um, one of the um, New things that we developed a few years ago was something called the Future of Computing Academy. Um, this isn't open to everyone, but it, it's an example of, of um, ACM's commitment to the future of um, well, the future of the technology, but also to the future of the society in general. We realize um, that the way the younger generation is doing business. Um, communicating is different than the way we have in the past. So we're very interested in sort of reinventing ourselves in ways that will be more relevant for um, younger generations of computing professionals coming along. So the Future of Computing Academy is there to advise ACM um, with early career researchers, mid-career researchers on the kinds of things that we should be doing. And I, I should say in terms of conferences, as I said, we don't have conferences specifically aimed at the younger generation. However, there are many ways for um, students to get involved in the, the conferences we have. Um, there's often travel grants. So if you don't necessarily have the money to go to a conference of your choice, um, many, many of the conferences will have travel grants what, that you can apply to to get your way paid. Um, there's also student volunteer activities involved in virtually every one of the conferences, that's a, a great way to get involved. So you don't just go and attend. As a student volunteer, you actively get to involve, be involved in the running of the conference and get to meet the conference leaders and a lot of people in the field. So there's a lot of different things that can be done, yeah. Um, so something else, uh, of course, which was touched on in the video, in which perhaps the, the ACM is, is most famous for is the, um, are the prizes. The, yes. the, the Turing uh, Prize, um, of course, perhaps being uh, at least the one that I recognise the most, being the, the British mathematician Alan Turing, of course. Um, so it was mentioned in the, the video that this is seen as the Nobel Prize of Computing. And I just wondered, do you like that name? <laughs> well, since we tend to use it, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it, it is really the highest honour in the computing profession, and, and that is undisputed, whether you like the name um, Nobel Prize or not, but it yeah. is the highest honor in the computing profession. Um, it, as the um, award said, it, as the video said, it started in 1966. And um, a couple of years ago, when I was at the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, I got a question about, well, why did you name it after Alan Turing? Um, so I'll, I'll tell the story uh, of that again, for those who didn't hear it the first time. Um, you have to realize that while ACM is now a global organization, in 1966, it was really much more of an American organization. It did start in the US. And so Alan Turing was obviously from England, not um, from the United States. Um, the other thing is that at the time he had been convicted of a crime because he was gay, which was not legal when he was alive in the UK. And so we were asked, you know, why, why did you name the award after him? It seems like sort of an odd choice. We went back in our history blogs to find out how the, the uh, name came about. And I talked to some of the people who were there at the time that the award was made. And for them, there was just absolutely no question that the award would be named after Alan Turing. He was um, undisputably the father of computer science and none of the what you might consider potential negatives uh, were considered a factor at all. He was just the most noted person in computing at the time. So the award was named after him. And I, I would like to say that um, the, the Queen did pardon Alan Turing in 2013. <laughs>
Yes. No, I, I was going to add that one. I was going to kind of, because it sounds, it, make, it makes the UK sound so awful, which I'm sure we were back in then, but at least, you know, attempted to, to, to rectify that mistake. Uh, absolutely. Before that, Gordon Brown did um, apologize to him, but the official pardon yeah. came from the, the Queen a few years later. Yeah. Um, and we've actually had a question through um, from the app, so I will just uh, find that if you give me a second. Um, okay, yeah, this is a good one. So the question is, what are the requirements for volunteering or joining uh, the ACM? Uh, if you can just quickly finish off with that one for us, Vicky. Well, there's absolutely no requirement for joining the ACM. Um, you can go uh, again to the ACM website and you will see a form for joining. And um, th that's it. Some people join through, uh, primarily you can join ACM. You can also uh, join one of the special interest groups that are, it's of most interest to your technical area. You can do all that online. Um, in terms of volunteering, for most of the volunteers, um, an interest is sufficient, willing to put in some time. Uh, it does tend to count as service requirements. Uh, I, I know the younger people, um, it, it can be a problem when you're just starting out in your career and you're very busy getting things going. Um, but there are some um, volunteer activities that count as service for you that uh, are not too time demanding. For the um, highest positions, um, such as an officer in the organization, you obviously have to be a member. But uh, in the earlier positions, that's not even a membership is not necessarily required. If you're just willing to devote some time reviewing some papers, uh, working for a conference, that kind of a thing, just uh, let people know. If, if you're interested, for example, in a conference, there will always be a conference chair or a program committee chair, and you can find their name online. Send them an email. Tell them you're interested in devoting some time and getting involved. Perfect. Sounds like there's no excuse not to get involved. <laughs> uh, right. So um, thank you very much, Vicky. That, that brings to the end um, this, the first part of the uh, discussion today. Um, I'm going to give you a, a round of applause. I'm sure everybody else is giving you a virtual round of applause as well. Thank you for, for spending time with us. Um, so next up, we have the Norwegian Academy of uh, Sciences and Letters. Uh, and we have a short video just to introduce uh, the organisation for you all.
and welcome back, everybody. Uh, you'll see that I have now been joined by uh, Oisteen Hov, the Secretary General of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, which we've just seen uh, the video telling us more about the, uh, the Academy and the work that they do. Uh, the Academy was founded in 1857 and exists to support the advancement of science and scholarship in Norway. Oisteen, would you like to tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and the Academy? Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am uh, the Secretary General here, and uh, I've been there for four years. And my background is as a meteorologist and professor of meteorology, uh, an atmospheric chemist. Um, the Academy itself is, is uh, multidisciplinary. It covers both the humanities and the sciences. So, um, and also medicine, so it is quite special in that way. It probably originates from the fact that Norway is a small country with a small population and uh, the main academy covers all the, all the major fields of, of science and, uh, and humanities. Um, we are fortunate enough to have this uh, building where I'm sitting. I'm sitting in the lecture hall uh, with the uh, paintings of, uh, of the great fathers of this institute. And, and I think if, if, you, if you look here, you can see Fritjof Nansen, who is uh, one of the patrons of uh, the Academy. Um, this building has been in the ownership of the Academy since 1910 and serves as a meeting place, as a social place for Academy members and for the general public. And, uh, and that is one of the great advantages of the Academy that we have this house here where people from different sectors of society and, and the sciences and academia can meet and discuss. And of course, as we all are in the pandemic. Uh, um, a week ago, we had the first meeting here in seven months and not with a full audience. So that has been very special. I don't think that has happened such a long break since uh, the Second World War, 75 years ago. Um, the, the three pillars of this academy is, is um, to, to foster and promote science. And then it is the prizes, and we have the Abel Prize, which we're talking about here, and the Kavli Prizes in nanoscience, neuroscience, and astrophysics, which are also international significant prizes, and a few others. And then we do, the third leg is science advice for policy, where we, where we do specialized activities to, to serve as, as uh, science, to provide science-informed information for policymakers on specific items. And we do that in collaboration with the international uh, um, acad academia associations. And the academy has uh, about 300 members below 70 years, but everybody keep their membership when they retire, but then we can add on new members. So the total membership is more than 600. Um, having a meeting place like this is, is uh, has served Academia in Norway quite well because it is such a multidisciplinary place and it's a nice place to be. So it it is it is uh, it promotes uh, interaction and uh, and new things can happen here. Um, and we have missed it quite a bit during this pandemic time. So we were not allowed to meet and we had to sit like this and uh, and see those two dimensions. That actually um, brings me on to um, something that I did want to raise, in fact, because, of course, the, the Arbel Prize uh, this year was announced in, in sort of mid-March, just as everything with the pandemic was really sort of taking off around the world. So how has, how has that affected the, the awarding of the prize and the usual week of celebrations um, in, in this particular year? Of course, as you all know, they, we... Uh... We did the announcement in, in the ordinary way because that's done uh, from here, from the academy building and broadcast it uh, in real time. But then we had to cancel the celebration. So the Abel week in late May, which usually is a beautiful week with uh, a lot of uh, parties and, uh, and, the, and the solemn celebration in the, in the university auditorium here in Oslo with the monk paintings and the king, etc., it was all postponed at, uh, till 2021, May 2021. And uh, 
the laureates, they re have received their prizes, but they haven't received their diploma. So we really hope to get them here uh, in May next year. But of course, we are not certain about that either, because we, we do not expect to do these celebrations until it is safe to travel. And, and that, as we know, is not for anyone to tell when that will be. Yeah, and the, um, I, I was fortunate enough myself in 2018, actually, to, to come to, um, to Norway to, to join in the celebrations for the, the 2018 Arvel Prize with Robert Langland. And, and as you yeah. say, it really is a fantastic week of, of celebration of maths, of, of lectures, of, of parties. And, and as you say, and also I think it was fantastic to see um, King Harold actually presenting the, the award yeah. um, to, to the prize winners. It's, it's, it's really quite something. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully we'll be back soon. <laughs> um, we've, we've had a question uh, come in from one of the uh, young researchers, uh, which asks, are there any special opportunities for young researchers in particular um, at the Academy? Uh, I don't think we offer particular opportunities for young African researchers in, in the academy as such, but for uh, the Abel Prize through the International Ma Mathematical Union contribution to it, we contribute financially to IMU and IMU have set us out nominating prize committee members and uh, promoting the Abel Prize through IMU. Through that mechanism, there might be um, uh, uh, special structures that is available for African students, for instance, in uh, teaching, etc. Um, so there has there has been also um, uh, projects funded uh, by by donors to to do math education in uh, in uh, in specific African countries, but this is more on off and it's a fringe activity of the Abel Prize. I'm glad you mentioned. Um education opportunities there because that's something um, that of course is very close to my heart as somebody who does uh, you know online maths uh, education on, on YouTube and different things and um, it, it does actually say in the description of the Arbel Prize that the prize also contributes towards raising the status of mathematics in society and stimulating the interest of children and young people um, in mathematics so I just wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about that and sort of why that is seen as such as in, uh, an important goal for, for the Arbel Prize? Well, um, that was the first requirement of the government uh, in their support, financial support of the Arbel Prize was that this prize should actually stimulate the interest of, in mathematics among children and youth. So that is, uh, that is a requirement. The prize shall also boost the status of the field of mathematics in society. So these two are where the main requirements, besides, of course, recognizing pioneering scientific achievements in mathematics, these were the requirements by the government. They wanted to use the prize as a mechanism to foster interest and enthusiasm for mathematics among students and children. And so there are, there are a lot of activities during the year in the, in the name of the Albert Prize to uh, to, to build up interest in this way among school children of all ages. So there are, uh, and, and here we involve um, the mathematic teachers uh, unions to do that. Um, so, so this is quite a movement, not only in uh, Norway, but all, in all of Scandinavia at, and at times in other countries as well, where we have these Abel, Abel Prize competitions and Abel Prize activities that, uh, that actually attract quite a number of, of uh, students and, and uh, school children. And uh, um, I think it is quite successful and it's a, it's a wonderful idea in my view, because you also invite some of these students and, and children to the celebrations in the spring. So that there is a sort of, a, it's, it's, it's a sort of smiling, smiling activity. It's, it's, a, it's an addition to their, to their everyday life. And it, it has been, um, it, it has, there is quite a bit of enthusiasm around it. Uh, and that is in many ways, a main purpose of, of this prize is that it has this aura of uh, something that is not everyday like. Uh, the mm -hmm. king, king comes there and you have these, uh, you have the, uh, you have these festivities, these 
<coughs> these uh, geniuses coming and it all has this special flavor to it that uh, lifts it out of the ordinary. And that is what we missed this year that we were not able to show this. And this is also the character of the academy that it adds this sort of intangible flavor of, uh, of uh, something mystical and positive to it. Yeah, I, I certainly remember again when when I was there for the, the prize week. Um, all of the the uh, the laureate that year, um, Robert Lang was actually going into um, a local school to to sort of go and meet yes. some of the the students and everything. It, it yes. you could tell, as as you say, the the the, uh, the students were definitely in awe of being able to sort of meet uh, yes. the, the prize winners. I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got another uh, question which has come in, um, and this probably will be our last one. We've got about two minutes left. Um, so this question says. Um, does the Norwegian Academy of Sciences have any particular advice on uh, strategies for providing advice to policymakers? Well, <clears throat> that is a that is an interesting question. We we uh, actually have uh, have been promoting sp uh, specific issues, uh, um, scientific advice on specific issues, like uh, um, uh, forestry practices or soil practices, urban planning practices. Uh, on health issues and, and with, or decarbonization of transport. And the way we do it is that we attract an expert group in Norway that is very familiar with the scientific challenges. And then we, we, ta we take in uh, reports on this from, uh, from European academic associations that have been actually had working groups on these issues. And we, trans we transform these documents into Norwegian conditions and we contact the policymakers in the ministries and get this triad of scientific expertise, um, pol policymakers and the academy as a, as a, um, a catalyst to make this working and, and, and do it over time so that as policy, as the poly, policy issues mature, we also provide uh, continuous advice in that, in that sense. So it's a, it's a mechanism which we have the experience is working, but it's quite demanding. Okay, right. That is just about uh, all we've got time for. So, so Oisin from the Norwegian Academy of Sciences, thank you uh, very much once again. We can have a, a virtual round of applause for Oisin for, for sharing your time and, and answering those questions. Okay. Uh, so now we come on to the third uh, presentation of, of this session. So this will be from the International Mathematical Union. And again, there will be a, an introductory video which we'll play now, and then we will uh, do a Q&A afterwards with the uh, General Secretary. For 121 years, every four years, men and women from all over the planet break down frontiers and together create a story of a land where knowledge, overcoming the limits of intelligence and passion are the main characters. In 2018, for the first time in history, country in the Southern Hemisphere has been the host of mathematics' greatest celebration. The multifaceted culture, the abundant nature, 
and that unique joy of Brazil and Rio de Janeiro proudly welcomed the International Congress of Mathematicians. Since this is the first ICM ever held in the Southern Hemisphere, we should not forget that right now we are in Rio de Janeiro, we are at the opening day of this Congress, and we should enjoy the uh, lectures that will come in the following days. Most of the work we have done over the last six years in building up for this moment was devoted to promoting popularization of mathematics. I want to thank you all for coming for this Congress and to wish you a very pleasant stay in, in the marvelous city and in Brazil. Enjoy Rio, enjoy ICM, and most of all, enjoy mathematics. Over nine days, a magnificent panel of human diversity worked together, exchanging ideas and visions of mathematics. Developing thought processes and relationships that can interpret and give new meaning to the world. In this mathematical territory, challenges build the way in an incessant search for understanding nature, understanding the universe, and above all, understanding ourselves. Together, creative minds can fly high. They break time's rational clock, change the course of history, and influence generations. And suddenly, unknown universes become essential. So we are now joined by uh, Helga Holden, who is the General Secretary uh, of the IMU, uh, as we've just heard a lot about the organization uh, there in the video. So Helga, do you want to uh, sort of introduce yourself briefly and just tell us a little bit more about your role at the, uh, the IMU? Thank you, Tom. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so I'm the Secretary General of the International Mathematical Union. And I get regularly emails from people around the world uh, asking, can I become a member of the IMU? How can I become? What should I do? And the answer is always, no, you cannot. Because there, we don't have individual members. I'm not a member of IMU. Tom, you cannot become a member of IMU. But we have countries as members. So we are a little bit like the UN of mathematics. So we have 90 countries around the world as members. And we organize some of the big conferences where we award some of the most prestigious prizes in mathematics. And um, we, the next, uh, we saw the previous conference was, with, which was in Rio in 2018. The next one is coming up in St. Petersburg in 2022. 
and hopefully that will be as great an event as it was in Rio, which you could see from the video was just an amazing event. So this was I a... I can I can say a little bit more about the IMU. I mean, in a oh sure, sorry, I, I I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah, no, please please continue. So uh, I mean, we we organize the big conferences where we award in particular the Fields Medal and the Neville Lina Prize, which in 2022 we changed name to the Abacus Medal, and then we have various committees and commissions that are in some sense more interesting in this context. So we have a commission for developing countries that offers support for mathematicians from developing countries, uh, in particular younger mathematicians. Uh, and this is of course important in the context of the Heidelberg Forum. We have also a commission that is engaged in mathematics education, trying to improve and offer advice on the education of mathematics worldwide. Um, and we have a committee for women in mathematics to try to improve the gender balance in mathematics. And we have a commission on the history of mathematics. History of mathematics is always important and interesting to mathematicians. So we try to have many activities in many directions worldwide, but for countries. Mm -hmm. I think the, the way you described it as the UN of mathematics, I, I personally never heard that, but I think that's a fantastic way of, of describing uh, the role of the IMU. Um, I mean, this is a one sentence explanation, right? That includes yeah. everything. Um, so um, at the moment then, what what is sort of uh, the, the IMU currently working on? So, so in, in some sense, what, what at the moment is taking up your time in, in your role as general secretary uh, and happening for the IMU in 2020? Well, that's not easy to describe in a few words, but I think right after the, the, the previous Congress, we start on the next one. We're setting up committees that will select the speakers. I mean, the highlight of the conference is when the best mathematicians talk about their latest cutting edge research. So we, have, we are very careful in selecting the best mathematicians. We are selecting prize committees. We are working with the organizers. There are all sorts of problems in organizing a big Congress like this. Uh, so that's what takes a lot of time. Yeah, no, I, I imagine four years is far too short, in fact. <laughs> uh, so um, in, in terms of the, the conference coming up then in, in 2022, uh, you mentioned in St. Petersburg. So yeah, um, is anyone able to attend this conference uh, as, a, as a young researcher or do you have to go through an application process? How does that work? Yeah. So this is, this is, of course, a, a key question. So we offer support for young mathematicians uh, from all around the world in particular for developing countries uh, and uh, for mathematicians with, with less uh, with problems with their own funding. And there will be an application process for that. And hopefully the, the Congress can, can, uh, can happen in the good old physical way where we can all meet physically in St. Petersburg. And that's what we're planning for. Yeah, fingers crossed, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, as, as the, the video alluded to, and, and as you've mentioned, the, uh, the sort of next batch of Fields medals will, will of course also be awarded in, in 2022. Um, so could you just uh, tell us a little bit more about um, the, the prize itself? Um, and of course, the, the something that I always find very interesting, the, the fact that you have to be uh, below the age of 40 uh, to receive um, this particular prize. So I think it'd be great to hear a little bit about why, why that was sort of decided to be um, one of the rules of eligibility. Yeah, the, this is something that people have discussed. I mean, the first prizes were awarded in 1936 at the Congress in Oslo. Uh, and of course, the prestige of the prize has, has increased a lot. Uh, and, you know, it, I think is it, it is a special attraction that is awarded to young people because it's a game changer for their career. Before and after, it's a completely different word. After that, you are recognized by your peers as one of the big stars in, in the community, in, in your field. And uh, you can get positioned at the best universities. Everybody comes to your talks. You know, it's a game changer. In contrast to some of the, the other prizes, like the Nobel Prizes, where people tend to receive them at the end of their career. Um, so this, this is a major attraction and also, a, an interesting feature, it doesn't come with a lot of money. 
it does not come with a lot of money compared to the, the other prices. Um, but I think the attraction is that you're recognized at a young age as a star in your field. And, you know, I, there, there are probably many reasons why they decided to have put a time limit on it. I mean, in the beginning, it was not as sharp as it is now, but being mathematicians, you want to make it completely precise. So it wasn't <laughs> completely precise, right? Um, but, you know, my guess is that when the old men were sitting around the table discussing the status of this price, they were all looking at each other and recognized they would not give it to anyone else around the table. So they decided to give it to the young people who were not sitting around the table. So that's my take on it, but you don't know. I mean, hard to say. Yeah, no, very good. I, I, I'm with you on that. That seems a very plausible, <laughs> very plausible explanation. And of course, as you say, it really does uh, work to act to really help further the career of, of those promising young research. And that's something that, that's in fact even mentioned in the description of the prize. I think it says that um, it's to recognize outstanding achievement for existing work and for the promise of future exactly. um, achievement. The yeah. promise part is the interesting part. We know what they have done, but now we want to see what they can do in the future. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's brilliant. Um, and then a little bit more generally, I suppose, just, just um, thinking about mathematics as a whole, as a field, I'd be very interested, in, and I'm sure hopefully a lot of the other viewers will, like what is sort of exciting you at the moment in, in the field of mathematics? Are there any particular areas where there, there's really been some fantastic breakthroughs recently or, or something that's just sort of caught your eye or the attention of, of the world um, of mathematicians? Well, that, that's a, in some sense a personal question. People tend to get <laughs> excited, right? I mean, the biggest yeah. thing that happened to me is related to what I'm working on, which may not be interesting to anyone else. On the on the grand scale here, I mean, on the global scale, it, it's hard to say, but there is this, uh, this discussion about uh, artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning, that's catching the attention of many. You have math biology going into neuroscience, where people are asking deep questions that are hard to put into mathematical terms. I mean, we have the, the great success of natural science, going back to Newton, Leibniz, where you could describe nature in, in fantastic laws. But what are the laws for mathematical laws for uh, the brain? What are the, the mathematical laws for machine learning? We see the great success of it, but why does it work? Some of these things are big challenges mathematically. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely, I agree. And of course, the, the, the mathematics, um, when you mentioned math biology, of course, there's obviously been a lot of talk this year about uh, disease modeling and, and everything that's being you know, mathematics is now an incredibly powerful and useful tool in, in helping governments around the world to, to make decisions, um, you know, in, in the current situation. Yeah, so suddenly people talk about these, these uh, models, the SEER model and uh, derivations thereof of, of modeling the, the spreading of, of, um, of the pandemic. And because these models become very sophisticated and you can put them on a computer, you can do com simulations that you couldn't do, say, five years ago. And it's, it's just amazing what you can do. Yeah. Right. Well, um, I think that's about all we've got time for in the session. So, Helga, again, thank you very much for, for joining us. I will give you a, a round of applause from my end and I'm sure you're getting a virtual uh, round of applause for everybody else. Uh, Thanks, everyone. And, and again, thank you very much uh, to everyone for joining us uh, for this session. Uh, that there will be a, a talk, uh, I believe, in two hours from now, uh, the next talk, where uh, I'll be back again. So if you saw me this morning and you saw me now, I'll be back in a couple of hours for the, uh, for the next talk. And then we have um, three or four sessions uh, back to back to take us into the evening uh, and to close off the, uh, the 2020 virtual uh, Heidelberg Laureate Forum. So hopefully uh, see you all very soon.